Hello everybody, welcome back. Round 8 from the Sinkfold Cup and uh, the excitement is rising as uh, there has been an unexpected, uh, well, to some degree unexpected change in the lead which is now taken by Firugia who actually uh, managed to come out on top in his game against Wesley So and of course that is going to be the game we are looking at today. So interestingly enough uh, this game was quite a bit played in the spirit of yesterday's games which I reviewed four out of the three out of the four uh, meaning that this was based on very thorough uh, preparation again and actually uh, it features a line that has been extremely frequently played and analyzed deeply by the elite and this is the Giaco Piano H3 rookie one and then a4 variation I have always uh, had strange feelings about this plan for white where they play b3 here I don't really like the look of this move I can't really put a finger on it why but it just rubs me the wrong way of course engines number one choice so I am not going to debate uh, the validity of the move but it just doesn't feel right to me to to, to play this move anyway um, the game continued rookie 8 bishop b2 and tada we are out of book now on that note it's not exactly the most spectacular way to get out of book. Uh, bishop b5, knight f1 are the two moves that were played in this position. The engine comes up with the absolutely mysterious rook a2. I mean, that is worthy of an X-Files episode uh, to figure out the mystery behind why rook, e2, rook a2 exactly. I'm suspecting that after some trade, knight c4, perhaps the rook can come to one of these two squares. Uh, but then again, I just took a quick glance at the engine and after rook a2, rook e7, it recommends rook a1 as the top choice. So, um, yeah, welcome to the world of computer chess. Instead, uh, Firugia went with bishop b2 that the engine frowns upon. I mean, hello, of course, instead of developing a minor piece, you should play a totally meaningless rook move. I mean, goes without saying. But to be fair to the engine, after d5, indeed, it feels that black comfortably has equalized. Bishop b5 takes e4 and here is the point when Firuja drops the ball real real big time and uh, an easy one to do so by the way by taking back with the pawn. This is the first step towards uh, a very slippery slope which uh, Aliriza nearly slid down all the way to the bottom by the way. Uh, knight takes e4, knight takes e4 and rook takes e4 was necessary here. Note that DE, which is much, much more natural than taking with the rock, would lose at least a pawn after queen takes, queen takes, bishop takes, b3. That's why I don't like b3. There you go. Now we figured it out. Oh, good. No, I'm, I'm kidding. Um, anyway, so he took back with the pawn, but now the price to pay is quite high because here black gets to execute one of the most typical and most annoying plants in uh, the uh, Giacopiano Piano and Rui Lopez, which is this knight maneuver, knight f6, knight f4. Now we get to do this so rarely that in fact black very often uh, deploys uh, another maneuver just to at least be able to threaten with that idea. And likewise, by the way, white also very often hopes to uh, jump on f5 with a knight. Now the reason why right now this move is so good is because um, the stars just perfectly aligned for black for this to work. So let's take uh, into account what factors contribute to this move or rather maneuver being effective. First, the bishop is miss missing from c1. So a, a simple knight f1, knight f4, bishop takes f4 is not there to eliminate that threat. That's one. Number two, which is very, very important, that usually this knight h5 sortie is quite easily exploited by the fact that it's sitting on a diagonal and is unguarded. And so we very often end up having tricks like this, except due to the open d file and again, Due to the fact that this bishop has gone to b2, now the d2 knight is hanging. And so we can just take, and when the queen takes on h5, we can just take and even take this. So if we keep on eating pieces, and of course there is this, which immediately decides uh, the game. So there is just too much stuff hanging here for white. Maybe rook e2 could be tried, but after queen f4, bishop takes, 
and uh, even rookie 8 wins but um, black uh, rather the engine sorry here already is going after the white queen uh, making no compromises whatsoever so this doesn't work either which means that we are left without any meaningful remedy against the knight coming to f4 and once that knight lands on f4 uh, troubles will begin knight c4 was played now um, the evaluation of the position is minus 2.6 which on this level should be decisive but it wasn't <coughs> queen f6 was played best move bishop takes c6 was played according to the engine another at least inaccuracy if not mistake takes and uh, knight c takes e5 um, now this feels safe because the knights are guarding each other but in fact when knights are guarding each other that is almost always a really bad scenario because neither can move without allowing the other to be hanging bishop takes h3 is the most obvious strike and that's exactly what wesley saw uncorked here and i'm certain that at this point uh the spectators the commentators and wesley himself uh were certain that this game is uh, already ready for the taking and uh, Wesley is going to come out victorious but that wasn't to happen because uh, Firuja here turned on uh, the defense the defensive mastery and by the way uh, a very important note that just occurred to me now was that uh, Hans Demon said in his interview that if you want to beat Firuja you need to attack him because he hates defending and he defends poorly well he actually put up the most tenacious defense here um, and actually he fought his way back. So let's see what happened. Rook d3. And here was the moment where Wesley soldiers should have listened to uh, the greatest teacher that we all have in common. And that is Paul Morphy and Yasser. Uh, because they both popularized the idea of bringing all the boys to the party. And Rook d8 would have indeed been the obvious move to complete development. I tried to figure out the reason why he wouldn't have played it. And the best I could come up with was that actually the engine and its line with knight d4, queen f3, bishop g4 leads to a position that may not be as obvious uh, for many, including me, why this position, for example, is nearly minus 3 with that even material. But unfortunately for white, the immense activity of the rock and the two bishops um, are decisive. Note, by the way, that here there are a few very beautiful lines, so I will show you some. If uh, g takes h3, knight f4. And now we have got the mate threat, and d3 is hanging, so this is terminal. And here actually comes a, a motive that I'm pretty sure most of you would have come across in puzzle storms or puzzle rushes, and that is this classic queen check, queen block, seemingly defending everything, but nay, nay, brother, that's a pin. And the queen is falling because it's check, king has to go wherever. And the game is over. So that was that line for sure to reckon with. So once again, rook a d8, knight d4 to blockade the diagonal and the d5 pin as well. Queen g6, mate threat, queen f3, defense, attacks. Here, queen e3. And after bishop b6, now the brutal threat is c5, c4. And against this, the only measure is knight f4. And now we arrive in this engine line, which once again, according to the machine, is uh, clearly better after the masses of trades for black. So maybe Wesley mis-evaluated mis this position or some of the positions earlier when considering rook a d8. And eventually he settled for queen g6 and this actually throws away the vast majority um, of the advantage. One more thing I wanted to show you here. Uh, sorry, I need to go back a little bit. After knight c e5, bishop takes h3. Of course, the point of this uh, beautiful strike, which I completely forgot to explain, was the fact that after pawn takes h3, black has rook takes e5, and the rook is immune due to this beautiful checkmate in two moves. So that was the core idea. The whole mechanism works because of this bishop takes h3 capture but after knight d3 queen g6 was actually a step towards the wrong direction despite it being a uh, brutal absolutely brutal threat with uh, queen takes g2 now uh, moving on 
He plays knight um, h4. Um, queen g5 was played, knight takes c5 was played, and after queen takes h4, unfortunately for Firuja, the advantage is, uh, of, excuse me, unfortunately for Wesley, the advantage is already gone. So if we do, uh, go back a little bit here, knight d3, queen g6, knight h4, queen g5, and after knight c5 here too, actually, shockingly, rook a d8 needed to be added to the equation before taking on h4. And now again, after queen f3, bishop g4, exclamation mark, black retains some advantage because now again, the rook dominates the d file and uh, white has got zero pieces on the king side to defend with. So um, that's a biggie there. Um, there was one more motif I wanted to show you here that was based on some queen g3 ideas, but maybe I missed it earlier, maybe up here. No, I took a note of uh, of a queen g3 idea at one point, but I've forgotten now where I put that variation. Maybe it will pop up later. Anyway, so knight c4, queen f6, tuck, 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 bishop h3, knight d3, rook a d8 was the necessary move here. Um, and again, rook a d8 was the necessary move here as well. Um, and after queen h4, g takes h3, now black doesn't have too much left in the tank. Most pieces have been swapped off. And in fact here, uh, instead of check picking off the knight, rook e5 was the way to go. And uh, now we have got a dual threat of uh, rook g5 and rook takes c5. Bishop c1 is forced. And even here we don't take here, but play queen h3 and uh, retain or rather, um, continue the attack instead of taking the piece. And after b4, rook a e8, what a move. And uh, black has got a vicious, absolutely vicious attack. f5 is a threat. And uh, let's say what happens if I just play a pass, like actually this is a very good pass because now I'm threatening with c4, bringing a rook into the defense, rook e6. Sensational, absolutely sensational. Knight takes, rook takes, and now the mate can't be really stopped without heavy, heavy material loss. That's a beaut. And I just discovered it now. Wow. So actually, Wesley So had many, many opportunities in this game where he could have conducted this attack with a lot more vigor. And uh, unfortunately, after check and mopping up the knight, he's actually worse. Because now, all of a sudden, from its dying ashes... The phoenix bird has now risen and boy, that bishop that caused so many trouble and drama in the previous lines that I showed you why black was clearly better, now becomes the boss and allows white to be uh, the one dictating the events. And now black really has to be alert and immediately offer a queen trade and bail out with a slightly inferior end game. Instead, however, Wesley, who probably was a bit shaken by uh, all these events, played rook b8, and now comes e5. A slightly counterintuitive move because it blocks the diagonal, but more importantly, it blocks off the fifth rank. And that's a very important factor because now the knight hangs on h5. And if rook takes, we have bishop d4, queen takes c4, and there is an absolutely marvelous knight trap here. Check this out. Take, take. That being said, this endgame could very, 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 very well be played for a draw uh, with black after something like rook b4. This is hanging. This is constantly under attack. Why is beyond that better? But whether it's winnable or not, I don't know. I don't know. So this would have, would have been perhaps best. But again, Wesley completely drops the ball, plays g6 after only four minutes of thinking. And uh, now it's all over carnage time. I dare say he only reckoned with the immediate e6 perhaps, which is harmless because then I can take here and b2 hangs. And I also have the queen sliding across. But he must have overlooked that after bishop a3, the queen had nowhere to go towards the center and the king side. It had to back off. And all of a sudden, the king is too lonely. 
and uh, now the white heavy pieces and the rerouted bishop is going to wreak havoc. Wow, what an absolute turnaround! It is insane, and it's very rare actually to see this on top level chess that a game goes from absolute zero to hero. Um, yeah, wow. C5 was played trying to again redeploy the queen, but too little, too late. Check takes his forced check, and after queen f8 comes uh, the beautiful finishing blow, queen d5, and bishop takes c5, just mops up um, the game, and the rest is just, yeah, agony. Takes, knight f6, bishop takes, knight takes, and after taking on e8, Wesley resigned. After rook e8, bishop takes a5. We are transitioning into an endgame where white is two pawns up, has the bishop over the knight so all the advantages according to the engine it's plus seven and wesley wasn't interested in seeing it out to the end a shocking game in some ways because wesley had a fantastic uh attack and position and and uh, gradually it somehow slipped away from him and uh i'm very excited to see that ferrugia is now showcasing his defensive prowess uh, definitely was on the ropes and fought back like a champion and now we have got an absolutely open tournament again so the final round is going to decide the winner of the Sinkfield Cup so I'm super excited to bring the last round to you in the next recap video thanks for watching please don't forget to like to sub to comment and uh, potentially to super like and I will see you in the next video thanks for watching